Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Thanks very much for being with us this afternoon uh, for today's webinar, Using Shared Values and Cognitive Science to Drive New Narratives. We're joined by my good friend Doug Hathaway of Hathaway Communications. Doug and his team, as many of you know, have been working for some time on some really fascinating research into the ways that certain narratives about our country, about the United States, and the people who live here have taken hold and shaped public opinion, what we think about ourselves. They have found that communicators, Doug and the team have found that communicators can tap into certain shared values to upend problematic narratives and replace them with ones that can drive change and, and promote constructive dialogue. So over the next hour that we're going to be together, we have a few things we're going to touch on. We're going to explain, or Doug is going to explain, the cognitive science that connects narrative, language, and identity. He's going to share some of the research insights on the shared hopes and values of Americans that we can use to motivate people to support the work of your organization, whatever that might be. And we're going to offer a few key communications practices that can drive new narratives. All right, so a couple quick logistical items to get us started. If you haven't been with us before, hopefully you're familiar with this uh, ReadyTalk uh, platform. We'll be taking your questions, as we always do, throughout the presentation. You can use the chat box, which you should see down in the lower left-hand corner in that little piece of software. Just type your questions in there. You can also uh, engage with us on Twitter. We're following the hashtag ComNetLive. That's C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E, ComNetLive. And then, as always, we're going to be recording this webinar, we are recording this webinar, and we'll post it up online at comnetwork.org for free replays. Welcome to share it with your friends and colleagues. That'll be up online in just the next couple of days. Thanks again for joining us. And Doug, why don't you go ahead and take it away. Thanks a lot, Sean. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time out to join us today. I think uh, we'll have a lot of useful information for you. There's a lot to say and talk about narrative change and uh, narratives that define America and, and what it means to be American in people's minds. We've uh, tried to boil this down to be super practical for you with tools you can use um, to drive narratives that uh, can build support for your cause. So I want to start by first um, telling you a little bit about American Aspirations, this program which has been supported by the Ford Foundation who were concerned um, when their grantees were uh, raising the issue of continually coming up against narratives about America, what kind of country we are, that stood in the way of the sort of work they do for uh, grantees focus on social justice and addressing inequality in all its forms. And they wanted help figuring out how to, how to take on big narratives, and we'll talk about examples of those cultural narratives is the term that they use for them, that can get in the way of creating social progress. Uh, we're also working with the Narrative Initiative, which is a relatively new organization that was created by Ford and Atlantic Philanthropies to um, spread learning throughout the field about narrative and how important it is. And I'm sure there's a lot of you are here because there's a growing interest in uh, the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors in this idea of narrative and what it means and, and how do we use it to, um, to advance our work. There's a lot of ways to think and talk about narrative, and we're going to give you a couple specific ways, but I don't want to leave the impression that you know, this is the do-all and end-all. I think it's a good introduction, and you'll have some, uh, some useful ideas and tools, but there's lots of sources and places you can learn more about, about narrative. Uh, just quickly um, about Hathaway Communications for those uh, we haven't worked with before. We're a strategic communications firm <clears throat> with a mission, which is to help visionary leaders and organizations achieve ambitious goals that benefit people on the planet. And as you know, to achieve ambitious goals, you have to motivate and mobilize people. And there's an art and a science to doing that. And this webinar mentions cognitive science, and that is one area of science we pull from. Cognitive science, how the brain works, how people think and understand and process information. We also draw from social science and uh, motivational psychology. Um, I meant to say social psychology, psychology about intergroup sort of relations. Um, we have linguistic uh, linguists on our team who look at the science of language. So there's a lot of science that comes into play in communication. 
And what we're going to show you here in the work we try to do is pull insights from those science, sciences and make them useful to people who work in communications for social good. And one interesting thing is the science says that storytelling is the most powerful form of communication uh, for a number of reasons. We won't go way into that, but I do want to talk about briefly the difference between narrative when we hear that word narrative and how we're using it here and the idea of story and storytelling. We're going to talk in this case about narrative as ideas that frame our perceptions uh, and attitudes versus a story which is uh, an anecdote or an example of a specific person or character in a specific place, in a specific setting, in a specific situation, um, which can illustrate ideas like we're going to talk about. Um, but there are two different things. So we're talking about that narrative level. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to be uh, asking Tristan to advance the slides today. So I'll, you'll hear me continually saying that because I'm not in control of the slides. It says meta narratives. That's a word I'll explain. Meta narratives are ideas about people in society that shape our perception of the way things are and our preferences for the way things should be. So this is one of the terms that's used in the field of narrative. Uh, that ideas and stories that we hear about our country, about our communities, about people, um, are commonly shared in the culture, and those can also be called cultural, cultural narratives. So a cultural narrative is an idea that is so common in our culture that it sounds like common sense to people. And those ideas can be helpful to you as you're trying to change hearts and minds and motivate people. Uh, for the issues you're working on, or those ideas can stand in the way. So let's look at the next slide, and I'll show you an example of what we're talking about. And this is coming from the uh, American Aspirations work, where we're looking to understand big ideas that um, frame, and that's another word that's used here. These ideas frame our perceptions and attitudes of the way things are. What we're trying to understand in the American Aspirations work what are big ideas like that about the country um, that are helpful or hurtful from the perspective of trying to reduce inequality? And how do we disrupt negative narratives and how do we drive new ones? What you're looking here is a simple model that uh, boils down a lot of science into uh, three ideas. That narrative, these ideas that we hear about our country, about the way the world works, about people and what people are like, all sorts of ideas can be conveyed um, in cultural narratives. Those ideas that we hear actually frame our own individual identity, and we get our, our ideas about what people are like and how the world works that way, and they start to become part of who we are and how we think of ourselves and of our place in the world. And it's our identity that drives our behaviors. If we see ourselves as a certain kind of person, we are motivated to take behaviors that reflect that sense of, uh, of ourselves. And that headline here is part of the, what I consider sort of good news from social science that we draw from in our work, is that people are motivated to live up to our ideal selves. When we have aspirational ideas about what kind of person we are or what kind of person we strive to be and the aspirations for the kind of life we want to live, uh, if we have those ideas, we are motivated to live up to those. And we as communicators can, can tap into that if we tap into and understand people's aspirations and values for what kind of person they are or what kind of person they want to be. If we really understand that, we can tap into that and motivate, uh, motivate them to um, uh, take action or to think in new ways uh, that can help you achieve the goals that you're trying to work towards. So this is a simple part of the model and why narrative you know, really translates in a very meaningful way into changing attitudes and behaviors that can make the world a better place. So moving on to the next slide, we'll give, start with an example of a cultural narrative that sort of plays that role both as a cultural idea but also plays into personal identity. And uh, there's an image coming up on the screen of a cowboy, and it's a common the common image in our culture of the rugged individual and the self-made man and the idea of individual responsibility. That's a very common idea in our culture. Um, there's another idea 
that is also common in, uh, has been common in our culture on the next slide that we don't hear as often in uh, our political dis debates and conversations. Um, that idea about individual responsibility we find, and I'm sure many of you do who do policy advocacy, um, find that the idea of individual responsibility gets in the way when you're trying to promote social programs like anti-poverty programs. And people respond by saying, well, you just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You don't need help. But another idea that's in American culture is the idea that we work together, that we build communities together, that we are stronger when we work together. Um, this is also a, an idea in our culture. And one of the questions that we explore in our work, and that is important on the issues that you work on, is to think about what cultural narratives, what big meta narratives that are out there frame people's perceptions of the issues you work on and their attitudes towards those. Is individual responsibility one that you run up against? If you do, that's a very common one. The idea of social responsibility might be familiar to many of us on this call, but what we've found in our research, and many others have too, is that it's not on the tip of the tongue of most Americans, that the idea of social responsibility, of joining forces to uh, change society and that sort of thing, is not as common in our uh, political conversation, which is where a lot of these ideas are driven repeatedly. And that's one thing that um, is critical, is that people need to hear ideas consistently for them to uh, take hold and become part of their identity or the way they see themselves in the world. And we asked people in a survey um, about their personal values, what kind of person do they want to be, and their, also their personal goals, what kind of life do they want to live. Because if we can tap into those, as I said, we can frame all kinds of issues and causes in, in terms that really motivate people. The next slide shows what we heard when we asked people about these two ideas. Um, we framed one in terms of uh, living in a country where people take uh, responsibility for themselves. Would you like to live in a country like that? And we gave people they could rate um, on a scale of 0 to 10 whether that was, was not important to them at all or extremely important to them. Ten, and what I'm showing you is these percentages represent the people who said it was 10 out of 10. So 10 out of 10 people, 80% of those surveyed said they wanted to live in a country where people take responsibility for themselves. But on the right, you see 74, you know, practically the same number of people wanting to live in a country where people look out for others. These aren't incompatible ideas. They can go together. The question is, in our political context and in the conversations that you're part of in trying to drive the change that you're trying to make through your work, what ideas are operative, what narratives show up, what is really in people's heads that are framing how they perceive and respond to your issue and ideas. So that's the first thing you need to understand about the narratives that might be operative around the issues that you work on. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is that, uh, a question we asked in our survey about personal values. Again, we gave people an opportunity to rate from 0 to 10, and you're looking at all the 10s. So if you skim that list on the left, you'll see a number of words that reflect values or personal traits. And then the numbers uh, on the right show the percentage of people rated that. So you can see at the top the word responsible was rated a 10 out of 10 by 73% of people in our survey, which rep our survey represented the uh, – general population, adult population of the U.S. And what we do with these, um, and this isn't, we have many questions, there's over 80 questions in this survey, but we can look at ideas like this and start to think about how do we talk about issues that we're working on in ways that reflect these ideas that are really important to people and their personal identity and what kind of person they see themselves as. So what I'm going to do is, um, and you can think of that too, you can see uh, start thinking about how your, your issues and work might relate to these. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning that we are going to be, uh, at the end of this webinar, you'll be able to take down some, some information and sign up at American Aspirations to get a guidebook 
that can provide information like this and, and have questions that can prompt you to start thinking about these, uh, these questions in relation to your issues. So let's go to the next slide. And we're going to um, take this idea of responsibility because it was one of the most important ones and it's so dominant in the culture, like that idea of individual responsibility. It's not the only issue we're talking about. We've been exploring ideas like these that you see on, on your screen. These are very common ideas that came up in people thinking about America and what kind of country it is and what kind of country they want it to be. But uh, let's go to the next slide and start digging into the idea of responsibility. And we held focus groups with people all across the country to talk about words like this and what they mean. And one thing that's important for you to think about when you're using values words like this um, in relation to your work, you need to define it in your own terms. Um, because as we said, responsibility can mean, for example, individual responsibility, which means to many people you take you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Um, and what happens when you use a word like that without defining it is that your audience, the listener or reader, is going to associate the word with however whatever um, associations they already have with it from wherever they learned that word originally or other ways they've used it, uh, they've heard it used. So in our political culture where individual responsibility is used all the time as pull up yourself up by the bootstraps, um, if you just say it, that's what you're going to activate, that idea. Responsibility is such an important idea that you don't want to leave it like that. Um, you need to own it for yourself. Um, so that's what we're exploring here. How do we define responsibility in other ways that encourage people to support policies, programs, initiatives that address inequality? And one thing we asked people about was the responsibility of business in American society because you hear a lot about individual responsibility, but you hardly ever hear to whether businesses do. Let's go to the next slide and show you what we found. In our focus groups, we have people answer questions like that. And every, uh, every, uh, everything people say is recorded, it goes into a database. And we have linguists on our team who then look at the language and they can show us uh, how people are talking about ideas the exact words they're using, and we have information about them, such as their race and ethnicity, their age, where they live, um, how they describe their political leanings, and so forth. So here's a young man from Tampa, describes himself as somewhat liberal, saying essentially that businesses don't have responsibilities to society. Um, and we heard this commonly. So the next slide shows uh, another participant in our focus groups, uh, another man, he's, in, he's middle aged. Um, from across the country, describes himself as somewhat conservative, and he's using different words, but he's saying the same thing. And that's why we have linguists look at language like this to discern the idea that's being communicated even when people are using different words. And this was one of our findings. People across the political spectrum did not have any language to talk about the role, the responsibilities that businesses have in society. And that's another idea that where there is a dominant narrative um, let's go to the next slide and look at that. The dominant narrative is that businesses' only responsibility is for profit. So you see on the left that statement, which is essentially the dominant narrative, I guess, you know, you, that is parade by Wall Street. Um, and that literally is what they say. The only responsibility of business is to maximize profits and returns for shareholders. What we did then was to counter that and the science says you're not going to, to counter a negative narrative or one that you want to uh, change, you have to offer an alternative. Um, it's not about talk, it's hard to talk people out of a narrative or an idea that's operative in their worldview or their self image. Um, so you need to offer another one. So what we did is just put together simple, intuitive statements that anybody can understand that offer an alternative. And what we did, we sent these out in a survey to people. Um, who could just look at these two statements side by side and then simply click on which one they agreed with more. So it was an instant response, and that's what we're looking for. And if you see that bar there at the bottom, you can see 84% of the people in a national survey agreed with the statement on the right. Uh, we showed this to a group of organizations that we are working with in Minnesota 
with a narrative initiative that I had mentioned um, is supporting about a couple dozen groups working together who want to drive uh, new narratives in Minnesota. And one of them is about sort of corporate power and the influence of business in, in politics and society. And they're very excited to see that indeed a lot of people will respond to an idea like that, that businesses have responsibilities to their employees, customers, and communities, not just their bottom line. This idea can frame dozens and dozens of issues, and that's something that is really important when we're thinking about narrative. We're thinking about that idea that's in their head that can uh, shape their perception or attitude, whether you're talking about uh, protecting the environment from businesses who might pollute or paying uh, living wages. Um, there's so many issues that flow from this. And whether you hold one of these ideas in your head can affect how you are going to come down on issues like environmental protection, living wages, and so forth. And they're working on living wages. So the next slide shows an example of how you can take an issue like uh, a narrative like that and use it in your storytelling to talk about specific issues and to frame stories. And the word frame is one that's used a lot in our field these days. The way we're using it here is to say you frame a topic um, in order to influence the way the audience thinks about it and responds to it. And you do it, do it by, making, by framing it first, making a statement like this at the beginning of your um, story that you're going to share with them or the example they're going to give you. And this is important insight from persuasion studies about storytelling. And at, at our firm, we call it strategic storytelling. You can learn how to tell stories that um, really capture people's attention and, and touch their heart, and that's great. That's absolutely critical, actually. But for it to drive narrative change and change attitudes and perceptions, you actually need to state a lesson or value like you see on your screen, and you have to state it first. Um, what the studies show is that if you do that, afterward people will retain that idea. It will shape the lesson they take away from your story. And if you do it afterward, they won't. So they're going to retain it if you frame it first. And that's as simple as that, as you can see here. This is a video about um, people you know, making the living wage, and we just simply started it by showing that, that meta narrative to frame it. Uh, let's look at the next slide. And then what we're showing here is examples of other ways you can use that. Now that we have this uh, new narrative frame about the responsibilities of business, you can start to spin out different messages. So you see on the left, um, this is a mock-up of a um, tweet where, there, where we're sharing a story of a business person who actually does pay a living wage to his employees. So that's a good story. That, um, and you do want to share stories of people who are living up to the ideals that you're working toward. That motivates others to do it and see how we framed it. That's what a responsible businessman does. He pays a living wage. So see how different that is from the idea of and how the idea of individual responsibility is so often used in our political culture. You can own ideas like that too and use them to get on the moral high ground for your issue. And that's another example on the right of a story that was in CNN about a working mom who makes a living, uh, makes a minimum wage, and it's saying she's a responsible mom. Does her employer have a responsibility to pay her a living wage? So you can see the power in these words and ideas like responsibility, and hopefully see the, the potential you have to use them in your own way and to frame the storytelling and the facts and the examples that you use in your communications. Uh, let's move on to the next. I think we might be coming up to uh, Q&A. Oh, no, we have another example here to step back and show you um, the different levels that you want to think about when you're developing messages and stories. This is a little framework that shows responsibility at the center. This is the idea that we were just talking about and just one idea that we could have in our toolkit to use in uh, communicating about lots of issues. And here we've put that meta narrative that businesses have responsibilities. And then you have issue narratives. Again, dozens of issues can, um, can connect to this idea. 
and we call those issue narratives. What is the way we want to frame that particular issue? In this case, we're bringing that idea of business responsibility to the idea of living wages and saying businesses have responsibility to pay living wages so hardworking people can provide for their families. And then you might also, and I'm sure you will, have messages about that particular issue that might be persuasive to particular audiences. So for example, if you're working with policymakers who uh, want to support policies that um, contribute to economic growth, you might use this message, paying good wages drives economic growth in our communities. There might be lots of messages there. And when we're working on issues with um, different organizations and coalitions, we find that people are spending most of their time thinking about those, uh, those types of messages, which is absolutely critical, but not thinking about these narrative frames that really do influence um, your audience in powerful ways. So that's all we're doing here is sort of giving you tools and, and food for thought to think at that level. And the guidebook that you can um, sign up for when we're done with the webinar has, uh, has some questions that can help prompt you um, to use this, this sort of framework. And of course, we bring those ideas into our storytelling, just like it shown here. And that's what we call strategic stories, stories that are designed to convey uh, specific ideas that we know are persuasive to people and also use the, uh, the narrative language, the ideas that we want people to take away with them. So next, I think we get to uh, a pause for questions, I believe. Yes. So I'll stop there um, and turn it over for questions. Thank you, sir. Well, I know I learned a lot. Uh, we are waiting for a few questions to come in. Um, I guess the question I might have for you, Doug, the first one, if I could take the privileges, did this surprise you, specifically on the, on the business question, business responsibility? Did the, did the way these two things got weighted when you put them out, the idea of business having a responsibility not just to shareholders, did that surprise you? And if, if yes, why? And if no, why not? It did surprise me the results because as you saw from our focus groups, pretty much the other idea was on the tip of everybody's tongue. And ideas that are operative in the culture like that are obviously going to be operative in people's minds. And I was surprised that um, simply offering an alternative that was simple but powerful, uh, people responded to it. I was pleasantly surprised at that. And whenever I show that slide, I, I usually don't show the numbers and I ask the audience, you know, what do you think? How do you think this turned out? And more, more often than not, people expect the dominant narrative to win in that contest. So a lot of people were, are surprised by that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I have to confess, when I saw those numbers, I was shocked, uh, pleasantly surprised, I suppose, but shocked just the same. So we're starting to get a few questions in here. Uh, let's see here, guys. You're jumping in. This is great. Uh, Lori Warren uh, from Reddit asks, how do we balance the individual responsibility there with the systematic causes of the issues that we work on? without getting buried in layers. In other words, how do we keep it simple and clean, but understand the fact that personal responsibility isn't the entire story here? Absolutely. That's a great question. And the, uh, what you want to do is frame your, uh, frame your messages in terms of the, the system, the theme that you want people to understand about the system. We have another example, which I'll show for, uh, that can help you think through that. Uh, because this is, that is a huge challenge. And in fact, that is literally one of the words we've been um, exploring is system. Because we heard so many people using the phrase, the system is broken, the system is rigged, the system doesn't work. And we also know from our work, and we work with many organizations that are looking to make systemic change. And that's really hard to talk about because you have to be trained to think in terms of systems. So it depends on your audience and their level of education and whether they are sort of systems thinkers as to how easy or difficult it is to get them to think in terms of systems. Uh, some thoughts for you to, as food for thought is that systems can be broken down into a few elements that are intuitive for people who aren't schooled in systems thinking. Systems are basically made up of people, of course, um, who are governed by rules and those rules can be formal rules or they can also be unwritten rules like 
uh, norms, social norms, um, and and practices. What are what are the practices um, that the people who work in that system? What are they doing? And people understand abstract or complex ideas like that in terms of somebody doing something. So you really want to talk about your system, about systems in terms of the people who make up that system. And what is it that they're doing that they should do differently? Um, what is the rules they're guided by that should be changed? Of course, that's what you're doing with policy change. Um, people can really start to wrap their head around it when you break it down like that. So that's some food for thought. We're still exploring that um, because it is so critical. And lots of times what we're doing at the narrative level is trying to open people's eyes to maybe one big idea about the system, not trying to explain the whole system. Okay, we have a bunch of great questions coming in. Thank you, everybody. These are all awesome. Our friend Ted Macron at the Boston Foundation writes in and asks, hey, Doug, I'm curious whether you see differences among demographics or age groups. Is there a willingness and ability of people to take in a narrative shift? So in other words, uh, I'm going to pick on my 75-year-old father. Is my dad one of those old dogs that's hard to teach new tricks? Is there more elasticity in the thinking of a young person, I guess is one way to think about it. Yep, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm no expert on this matter, but having looked at a lot of social science around different things like political identity, like I am a liberal or I am a conservative, there are stages in life where people are more open to shifts on something as fundamental as that. Um, and those are when you leave home. You know, you've, you've grown up uh, living under your parents' roof and learning their worldview, and then you go out in the world and you might encounter others. And research shows that people are open then. Also, at life changes like when you, have, when you have kids and a major life change like that. You're open to sort of fundamental sort of political identity like that. And then on issues, you know, that's really, I think, dependent to some extent on the issue itself and how, how important it is to your worldview. Uh, we worked on the marriage issue, the marriage equality issue in the U.S. for um, over a decade. And that, on one hand, is obviously a really um, foundational cultural institution and idea, obviously. And the dominant narrative was that marriage is between a man and a woman. And that's what the, um, our, our clients were trying to make it legal for same-sex couples to get married. And that was an issue, sure, marriage is close to people's lives. So that was, you know, I was told in the mid-1990s that we would never see, quote, gay marriage in my lifetime. And here we are today where 67% of Americans support uh, marriage equality. So there you had people from all age groups and all walks of life had to change their minds in order to make that shift because back in the mid-90s, only 27, it was 1996, only 27% of Americans said that they supported that. So this is a massive shift. And in a relatively short period of time, considering you're changing ideas about, you know, a, a millennia-old institution. Um, so to me, that holds out, you know, hope that you can change hearts and minds on even big issues like that with people from lots of different backgrounds. Thank you. Okay, one more question, then we'll get back to it. So our friend Kate Shatskin at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, who is suffering through the miserable humidity in the mid-Atlantic, just as we are here in D.C., she asks, can, hey Doug, can you explain the difference between what you're identifying as an issue narrative and key messages? So what's the difference between an issue narrative and key messages? Yeah, what we're talking about there is the, when you talk about an issue like in the example we use, the living wage, we're saying what is the highest, what is the narrative, the ideas that you want to frame that particular issue with? Um, so in that example, we brought in the idea of businesses have a responsibility to pay a living wage, and we framed it that way at the narrative level. And then we, then, then messages, specific messages for specific audience segments. So for example, in that case, um, for business people, we might have a key message that says, if you pay living wages, your, employer, your employees are going to be more loyal and you'll have greater employee retention and save costs on um, retraining people. 
So that's a very specific message for a very specific audience, a business person who's making a cost-benefit analysis versus like the example there for a politician who um, wants to, uh, whose priority is to show that they're out to make, you know, for the economic growth, we tailor it for them and say, when more people are making more money, we're going to get more economic growth. So that's the distinction there, just sort of overarching frame about um, a living wage in general that we want to frame it at the highest level versus particular points for particular people. Thank you. Actually, if you'll indulge me, Gypsy has a question a lot of people seem to like it, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Uh, Doug, have you done any work about global meta narratives, particularly about multilateralism? If yes, great. Tell us what you learned, and could you point us to a resource or resources? Yep. We have worked on narratives at, um, in multiple countries, and you do find them. Um, cultural narratives that transcend cultures and are common in uh, many different contexts, and we have worked on some of those. Uh, not about, um, uh, was it multilateralism? Yes, multilateralism. Yes. yes. Um, there's, a, there's an organization in Washington called the Truman Project that I think does, some, does good thinking about um, that sort of, at this sort of level. Um, and I think that might be a theme that they talk about and the importance of working, countries working together just the way like people work together. So they might, um, might be a good place to look as a starting point. And I'll add uh, Andrew Marshall, who's a good friend of ours and a network member, uh, was until very recently at the One Campaign. He's now at the Atlantic Council. Uh, lovely man, and I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you. If you want me to connect you, I'm happy to do that. So just feel free to send me an email. Um, and uh, we're going to get underway, and I've just learned my lesson. I'm going to stop complaining about the weather because our friend Catherine down in Houston tells me there's humidity and Sierra desert dust in Houston right just about <laughs> now. So sorry about that, Catherine. Yeah. I don't even know what that means, Sierra desert dust, but I don't like it. It doesn't sound good. Okay, <laughs> let's keep going. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm just looking at our time of 20 minutes. I'm going to go very quickly. I want to, at the end of this presentation, we're going to show you some tools that you're going to be able to get from American Aspirations. Tristan, why actually, let's actually do that. Let's go ahead and jump the negative narrative section. We could do another conversation about that um, if people are interested in it. So just definitely let us know. We're, um, we're going to jump to the third section of this because there are resources available for you, and I want to make sure you um, know what they are and can get your hands on them. And uh, just let, uh, let Sean know, let us know if you'd like to do another um, webinar like this to, to focus on the issue of, of disrupting negative narratives. That was the next topic that we, that we had here, but I don't want to give it a short shrift. Um, so this next section that I'll share in the time we have left is tools you can use. Uh, from the American Aspirations Program. And like I said, we've been uh, conducting this research in order to develop messages, language, and tools for, for you to use in your work. So let's take a look at the next slide uh, at one that's going to be available right uh, pretty soon. Oh, we have a list, actually. So if you look at this list, the first one um, is what I started talking about, a narrative change guidebook. You can download that at the American Aspirations website, uh, AmericanAspirations.com. And there you can sign up also to receive a newsletter. It's a blog, so you can peruse articles there. And you can sign up to receive these other um, tools that are going to be coming out soon. So the guidebook is going to be ready to go, so you can go to that right away. And then we're also going to have audience personas, and I'm going to explain what that is, but that's a tool for you to tailor content to people with different, um, uh, different sort of worldviews and perspectives. And then we're going to be having uh, webinars and workshops um, where you can use those and um, get uh, coaching and input on how to tailor content. Um, we are also in the field right now with a survey that, um, is, that we do to develop those personas, but also to test messages similar to the one I showed you about business responsibility. And we've got more than, you know, we've got more than two dozen 
messages that we're testing. So there will be a lot of them, and they are at this framing level that we're talking about. So that could really be a lot of useful language there for your toolkit. So we would um, encourage you to keep an eye out for that. And then at a ComNet conference in the fall, um, we are going to be doing a pre-conference session where you can really roll up your sleeves and uh, think about um, and plan out a narrative change strategy on a narrative that you might need to change for the issues that you work on. And you'll be able to, to draw on this research and these tools to do that. So I wanted to show you just a quick um, example of these uh, tools that are going to be coming available shortly. Let's look at the next one. Um, that's the guidebook. I don't have a whole lot to show out of it at the moment. But it's, it's going to show this material that we went through first, and it will uh, prompt you with questions. Um, the next one, let's go back to the previous slide, which shows the um, seven segments, uh, audience personas. This, um, what you're looking at is um, what we call segments. This study is called a, a, a segmentation study where we do a, a very long surveys with, um, with the public, and we ask them these really foundational questions about their aspirations and their values and their worldview and what kind of country they want to live in. We're not asking their opinion about, you know, what's your opinion on the living wage or on marriage equality. We're asking what kind of person they are and what kind of life they want to lead and what kind of country they want to live in so that we can connect to all, connect all kinds of issues to people in ways that will be personally meaningful to them. And what you see is that uh, in this case, and we do segmentations um, of different kinds on different topics. This one was what kind of country do you want America to be? And what kind of life do you want to live in it? It's a pretty big issue. Um, and we saw seven segments where people are um, expressing different ideas. And we give them clever names, as you can see, that are cues to what are their motivations and personalities that shape their perceptions, uh, their identity, and thus their attitudes and behavior. And what we produce from that is a persona. The next slide shows a simple example of one. Um, the ones that you'll be able to get are going to have more detail, but this is just giving you a taste of the kind of insight that this gives you. Um, these are, uh, this is a segment we call benevolent optimists, people who are literally benevolent. Their characteristics are that they're compassionate and generous. And look how they're using the word responsible to apply to themselves, and I think they're talking about social responsibility, actually. They're also optimistic, by the way. They, and we did ask, we were asking people about optimism and pessimism, which uh, studies show is a really critical um, determinant of whether you are more generous and open um, uh, or more or less generous and more closed. Um, what sets them apart, and that's what we're looking for, what makes them what did they say in their responses that were unique to them versus others? They respected more than others, respected people who are different from them, and want to make a difference in the world. That combination of, of values was particularly important to them. So these are um, uh, people really interested in inclusion and equality and, and uh, would be good to tap for movement. Those aren't their only values, and it's not that other people don't respect people who are different from them. In fact, respecting people who are different was one of the top four values that we saw in our, um, in our survey, or I should call it top uh, aspirations. People aspire to be someone who respect people different from them. And we were very pleasantly surprised that 70% um, of people had put that as one of their top aspirations in life. So that's, you know, there's lots of interesting insights here. So this segment, according to the survey, could you know, conceivably comprise you know, 26 million people. That's a lot of people you can communicate with, and you might have as an objective uh, to mobilize them for campaigns and causes based on uh, appeals to idealism and compassion and social responsibility. And the way we're using objective here is what do you want your communication to achieve? What do you want your message, your story, your campaign, what do you want it to achieve in your audience, and being super specific about that. And if you get your objectives clear, you should be able to measure 
your outcomes. Um, you can, as you know, raise awareness, change attitudes, or motivate behavior, and all three of those things are measurable. So we call them communications objectives. So as you can see as a communicator, you can look at this and start to think, oh, I can tell stories that might speak to folks with this mindset and communicate in different ways. We're going to show you examples of that. Let's look at the next slide, which is a different uh, segment, which is very different in its outlook. We call them secular moralists. And they were uh, valuing characteristics like being hardworking, responsible, and loyal. And what really made them unique from others was that, was that they rated a 10 out of 10, a desire to live by strong moral standards, but not but they rated religion low on their scale. Religion was not important to them. That was an interesting mindset, and it was a significant 8% of the adult population. Um, that's why we called them secular moralists. And that our objective might be to persuade them to support different causes by framing those causes in moral terms of right and wrong, and then mobilizing them through opportunities for them to express their values. And that's another thing I wanted to point out, that you can use insights like this for message and story, but also for engagement. How do people want to take action to help a cause? And somebody who says, my desire is to live by moral standards, um, one thing they might want to do perhaps more than others is to express those values that they feel so strongly about. So the next slide shows how we and you can use these sorts of insights to tailor um, content to drive new narratives. We, you can do them to tailor message, of course, but also the images you use, the stories you tell, and the way you engage people. Uh, let's go to the next slide to show an example of that. We're showing an example of tailoring a message on the issue of living wages. So that's back to that issue we were talking about before. So here, for a benevolent optimist who values compassion, we've got a message that we think speaks to compassion. Businesses should pay living wages so everyone can provide for their families. Um, they're inclusive. They want everybody to have that sort of um, be able to do that. There are other ways you can speak to compassion, of course, but the idea there is just to think of, of appealing to that particular mindset. And you can create content if you're using your social media. You can create content and send it out there, and people with that mindset are, are theoretically more likely to respond to it. And that's how we use these. We often take personas like this, create content, send it out, and then experiment and see who responds to what. And you'll see that people start to, you know, you'll get different people responding to them, and then you can communicate with those groups in slightly different ways. Um, and that's sort of a, you know, sort of an organic way to do it. Um, over here on the right, it's a different uh, way to frame it uh, in terms of a moral principles, principle that businesses should pay living wages because it's wrong for people to work full time and not be able to make ends meet. And framing things in terms of right and wrong is a good way to talk to people for whom those sort of principles are top of mind. Um, and the thing to remember is that that's not everybody. Um, when you do this sort of work and, and look at these different um, mindsets in the world, it's, there's a lot of them out there. And this helps you step out of your own personal, what the scientists would call your personal cognitive bias, the way you see the world, and understand it from others' perspectives, which, of course, as communicators, we're always trying to do. So this tool can be pretty help, uh, helpful for you. Just really quickly, we'll show the next slide, which is an example of showing different images. Um, remember our benevolent optimists, they are optimistic about the future, they're idealistic. So showing images of that ideal future um, could be a good idea for tailoring content for them. Versus on the right, maybe images that um, show the, you know, the moral outrage, that show people struggling with this, and can touch the heart of somebody who thinks that this is wrong and this is outrageous. Um, so think about tailoring images as well as your messages. Uh, the next slide is about tailoring stories. This is back to those stories that we showed you earlier um, about the living wage. On the left, you might, for the idealistic folks, sort of share, share a story of somebody living up to this world they're trying to create already. Um, they might be excited and, to share that. Um, versus this story of somebody struggling to make it by 
and you could share images from that to stir that sort of moral outrage. And finally, the way people want to be, um, want to be engaged on the next slide. Um, we see uh, we'll have insights like this for you for your call to action. And when we, the way we at my, our team defines calls to action is what you say that motivates people to take an action. And they might want to take different kinds of actions. So you need to know both of those things. What actions do they want to take? Um, is it something like this? Make a difference to be part of something bigger than themselves. That's, that's, um, that's for like a social activity and thinking, you know, doing protests and coming together in groups to do something. So our call to action is join the movement. Together we can make a difference. Versus people might be motivated to stand up and speak out. And that's exactly what we say there. And that's a different thing. You do that. You can do that as an individual. You can sign the petition. You can um, go to the town hall, that sort of thing. So here we're speaking to those sorts of behaviors that might go along with this worldview and this personality along with the, um, the message. Uh, let's see what's on the next slide. Um, so those personas are going to be ready soon. Also, you'll be able to get, as I said, we're going to have over two different, two dozen messages that we're testing. And they're going to be kind of like this, really simple statements. Uh, look at the one on the right. Simple statements you can use to frame all kinds of issues. This one is we call the myth of equal opportunity. On the left, you see a very common American narrative, which is a nice one, that says if you're willing to work hard, you can make it in America. People want to believe that. Um, what we found in our focus groups is that most people know that it actually takes more than that. You don't, uh, there is a system, right? It depends on where you're born. There's ideas like that that are also common in the culture about what it takes to make it in America that aren't all about hard work and individual responsibility. So this is one message. It takes more than hard work to succeed. You need tools like education, healthcare, and a good job. That for the person acting who was asking about the system and how do we talk about systems, this is one way. What does the system provide to people? And I was really interested in our focus groups when we asked people about the system and how, why did they think it wasn't working? They said, well, people aren't getting health care. The schools aren't as good as they should be. And they were seeing things like this as evidence that the system wasn't working. And as we saw in this survey, 10% um, more people agreed with that narrative than the other one. And that's a pretty hard, you know, that idea of working hard you can make it is a pretty powerful one. So you'll get messages like this um, as well if you sign up. I want to leave time for questions. So let's uh, skip over the next slide, I think is another another message, um, which I think you can just glance at this one. It's pretty simple. Um, this is a message to counter the idea that government should not um, be imposing taxes and regulations because of the economy. We got seven out of 10 people to say, well, in fact, government has a responsibility to make sure this economy works for everybody. Um, there's other messages like that. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, that was Q&A, good. Uh, I just want to, while we take Q&A, I want to show the last screen which shows the, um, the information that people can take down to, uh, to sign up for these resources and to get the guidebook. Um, so we'll leave that up while we um, take your questions. It says AmericanAspirations.com. If you go there, you can sign up. But also feel free to shoot us any questions. I see some great questions here that we weren't able to get to, and we're happy to um, to answer them or talk with you about your issues, just shoot us an email at info at hadaway.com. All right, Doug, here's a bunch of questions in here. Nur has a good one. Are there specific questions that a campaign pollster could ask to determine these sorts of personas? In other words, how do you get to these personas? Because polls normally just show you basic demographics, maybe some uh, ethnicity, gender, age, whether you're a homeowner, that sort of thing, likely voter. Yeah. How, how do you actually develop these personas and know where these folks are? Are there resources yeah. to find That's, that information? Yep. It's interesting because, as I said, that it's a lot. It's a lot more – you have to ask a lot more questions than you do in a typical poll where they're either testing messages on issues or testing candidates. Um, and that's my background is politics. I've looked at a thousand of these, and, and we work with political uh, clients as well. 
So what we're looking, asking here are more foundational questions about worldview and personality. We drew for this segmentation from a good half dozen sort of schools of thought in um, persuasion and personality research, such as um, one's called the Big Five, which is five dimensions of personality that are consistently shown to affect people's worldview and, and political sort of orientation. Um, and we also drew from moral foundations theory, which says that there's about half a dozen um, sort of moral foundations that people across cultures use to, to make moral decisions. Um, so we were drawing from a lot. Um, what a poster could do is maybe borrow from one of those frameworks and see if it, um, how it plays out in the, in the population that you're studying in your, in your poll. So there are, and I would, I would ask uh, a poster I was working with, do you look at this level? Do you look at that sort of foundational level? Um, if they don't have background in it, that might be tough. So you're typically going to be dealing with somebody who has some social science in their background or has spent a long time using this kind of material in their work, and that can be hard to find in the uh, political polling world. Okay, thank you. Robin has a question. She's curious to know how much of these individual persona groups and the age of those groups uh, are composed. So, like for instance, benevolent optimists. Are, there, is there a higher level of millennials or Gen Xers in these groups? Is there any way of divining that? Uh, yes, and that will be that information will be in the um, in the personas. So um, that all your answers will be there. Um, that's going to be, I think, next month that those will be available. We'll send out an email um, to give you a heads up, and all that demographic information will be there. So the answer is that, and it's interesting, there are people from all walks of life in all of these segments. Um, and one of the reasons to sort of think about your audience through these lenses is to, get, is to not get caught up in making assumptions about people based on age or ethnicity, things like that. Not that life experience and cultural background don't matter. Um, they do, and you take those into consideration, of course. But people um, will surprise you, and there will be people in these different segments that from, from the same group will fall into different segments. That said, um, there are concentrations, like young people. There are a lot of young people in that benevolent optimist. I believe we had more millennials in a group called Striving Individualists um, who were not about joining movements. They were about succeeding in their careers. Okay, a couple more questions, and then we'll let this wrap. I, I know you are busy, Doug. Uh, Jackie Rodriguez asks, is there any data or testing done on the importance of imagery and how it helps or creates bias when conveying a message? Um, there is, not as much as in our field that we found as there is on language. Um, and uh, that's an area that our team is uh, exploring more in a lot of detail because the old adage is true, a picture is worth a thousand words. And they are extremely important. And you really should be super strategic and selective about the images you use to accompany messages. There's, by the way, there is some research around, and it actually relates back to the last question, and how you might use demographic information when you're tailoring um, communic content for a particular segment. So what we give you in the insights, you're going to have ideas that appeal to them, like they want to make the world a better place, and an issue like living wage, and that suggests images of ideal future and people working. The demographics come in and the studies show that all of us, no matter our demographic, our racial or ethnic background, are more likely to respond to images of people who literally look like us. So you can tailor, you can use different images as well, of people from different backgrounds, and tailor content that way. You can expect you'll get um, responses from different people. And that's one of the, um, the realities of the way people 
um, view their world, understand their world, make judgments about issues and so forth, is literally visual cues. Um, so, and that, that is something you definitely want to take in mind, uh, take into consideration as part, of, uh, as part of your thinking about being strategic down these lines. I don't have a resource off the top of my head um, to suggest on visual communication right now, uh, but stay tuned for that too. It is so important that we're going to uh, delve into that and we'll share resources. Um, I will take the liberty. I know somebody else had asked if there's a book that we recommend. Um, there's a lot of them that we use for our work. I think one of the most fundamental um, that we turn to is Thinking Fast and Slow, which is by uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and psychologist. And that, if you're interested in all the psychological dimensions, he does a great job of, of um, boiling it down to language non, non-social scientists understand. And as communications people, we find insights we can use on almost every page. That's called thinking fast and slow. And I'll offer the beach reading version of Thinking Fast and Slow, which is the Michael Lewis book that sort of unpacks where he came from. Uh, it's called The Undoing Project, probably nine bucks these days on Amazon in paperback. A good quick read that helps to kind of help you understand where Kahneman got to and how he got there. Uh, anyway, I, I think we've run out of time. Doug, I want to say thank you very, very, very much for your time. Uh, if you haven't been looking in the chat box, Doug, it looks like you are coming back by acclamation. People would very much like to have you return to talk about disrupting negative uh, narratives. Um, while I have you guys, before you all sign off, if you would, please take the survey. We always ask you to do this. It helps us get better. Oh, the, the survey pops up. Tristan is telling me the survey pops up after, so hang on the line for a quick second. Three quick items I want to tell you about. Number one, if you haven't already bought your tickets for Comnet 18 in San Francisco, please do. we got 50 seats left. I'm telling you this. I haven't mentioned this to anybody else, but we'll be sold out by Friday. Uh, and if you get there, you can, of course, join Doug. He is going to be doing that pre-conference workshop. There's still seats available for that, for now anyway. Uh, Tristan is working on a really fascinating thing. I want to give you a heads up about the next issue of our Change Agent Journal. You only get this if you're a network member. But that is going to be focused on racism with our guest editor, Michelle Norris, uh, formerly of NPR and now at the Race Car Project at the Aspen Institute. And then finally, if you've somehow managed to miss it because we haven't been shouting enough in the ramparts, there's a brand new resource we've made available, just launched it the other day called Storytelling for Good, and it's a bunch of online lessons and case studies and other things, how-to guides that will help you bring storytelling into your practice at work and build a storytelling culture. So if you're looking for a little bit of help or looking to help your colleagues, a uh, terrific resource to point them to, and that's available at storytelling.comnetwork.org. All right, everybody, I'm going to let off y'all go. Uh, Catherine, good luck with the Sahara dust. I don't envy you that, and we will be back in very short order. Hope to talk to y'all again very, very soon. Cheers.